George Williamson. Hey, George, how do you spell your last name? Williamson is in uh, Bill's Boy. W I L L I A M S O N. Williams Son. What's your relationship to this project? Well, I was employed by the originally BC Electric, and in time they got involved with this project about uh, the early 60s. And uh, in 1964, they invited a number of hydro employees. BC Electric had now become BC Hydro, uh, the merger of Power Commission and so on. And with this project starting underway, they decided they would introduce or allow head office and employees to come up and see what they were all about. So they chartered this old DC-4 aircraft and up we came, parked at the airstrip, and we had a tour of the project in a bus, and they were just getting ready, or they had already diverted the river, the piece, through the three diversion tunnels, and everything was mind-boggling. The diversion tunnels were the equivalent of a six-story highway wide, 125 feet high, three of them, and that volume of water it was plugged during construction. But anyway, they fu having <coughs> diverted the river, <coughs> downstream was, was now dry, so to speak. And they actually drove the bus down and across the base of the canyon down there. And there were the dinosaur tracks for everyone to gawk at. And they were monitoring, uh, when I say monitoring, they were using the gas, the water jets on the side of the canyon, getting rid of all the crud, the soil, and the loose rock, and so on. And the last bit, they cleared it off with wheelbarrows and shovels. Now, now, we, now you were the pilot, though, yeah. is that correct? But, yes, but and that uh, first trip was strictly a, um, a visit. And from then on, the first trip in here f with the aircraft was an old Grum and Goose. And I was bringing people in, and I flew up and down, landed it um, up at Fort uh, Ware and, F and Fort Graham and so on. I don't know for what reason, but uh, we landed there. And then, as time got on, we bought a Japanese aircraft, a uh, turboprop. My, let's go back a pace. With the Goose, it would take me three hours to get here from Vancouver. The Japanese aircraft would be here in an hour and 40 minutes. Eventually, we got a, a jet aircraft, and I could get up here in an hour and five minutes. And in total, I've landed here 486 times, counting today. <laughs> but uh, we so were. When up, you had the jet. Uh, thing, how long is that runway? It's roughly a mile long, and the that's pilot. Not, that's not very long, is it? Well, 5,000 feet. That's plenty for the type of aircraft that were required. I mean, you're not going to put a 747 in there. But it has a slight uphill uh, run from the other end, and I told the pilot today, I said to him, you know, you should have landed the other way. It was uphill, and you wouldn't have had to taxi all that way back up the runway. But that's beside the point. The dam here, uh, there's so many things about it that are mind-boggling. The Okay, you don't, don't tell me those stories. I want to know, what was the thing that stands out in your mind the most well, during those years when you're coming back and forth up here? Well, one day, <laughs> one January, I came up here 28 days. Every day for 28 days, up and back from Vancouver for various reasons. And I've seen the thing from the bottom up. But you have to appreciate the construction we had a camp near this site, just back away, and uh, there was roughly 4,000 employees. That was the construction camp for the dam. On the other side of the river, or this side of the river down below, um, was the powerhouse constructors, and there was another 4,000 people there. And the, all the fill that came into that dam came from up on Portage Mountain. And they built 
the conveyor belt three miles long, plus some small ones that fed the uh, fed the uh, moraine into the into the uh, uh, conveyor belt, uh, and the conveyor belt was three or four, five feet wide, maybe six feet downhill and once they started loading it up with gravel it started to run faster and faster and they had to put brakes on it so they put generators on there and they generated a lot of the site power a lot of people don't know these things and as the moraine and the conveyor belt got <clears throat> down towards the top of the bank back here it had various it, they, it was screened out and they sort of separated the the different grades of material and that's what went into the dam in different grades. A lot of people don't realize that at the river bed level the upstream tow is one half mile above the downstream tow of the dam and it tapers up to the 635 feet. It is a mile and a quarter long across the crest when it was finished. But during construction, there were times, well, let's put it this way, on the upstream side, they had to make sure it was impervious. So there's impervious layers tucked in there. And there were times when it was freezing weather, they actually tried to insulate it so it wouldn't freeze. And I'm not sure if they didn't put uh, bales of hay and so on. But throughout the construction, there are actually little tunnels inside the dam in which there are sensing devices and in the powerhouse I think they can tell within a thousandth of an inch if there's any movement for example earthquakes or things like that. Big, this was a big deal. Wasn't oh it? big deal. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. I know you can go on and on. I can only take so much. Right? Okay. Okay. 